welcome to the Mindful Muscle Podcast. My name is Paul Klingen, and I am your host. I left a career at Amazon in 2018 to help people live healthier lives. Mindful Muscle is the balance between pushing harder to hit your fitness goals while also being able to slow down. We'll talk all things training, nutrition, and recovery while also highlighting the importance of mindfulness, slowing down, and taking care of mental health and performance. You'll hear from doctors, authors, athletes, coaches, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders in the health and wellness space. And you'll hear from me as an athlete, trainer, nutrition, and personal performance coach as I share my thoughts and experiences that are helping my clients and myself get better each and every day. What is up, everyone? Welcome to the Mindful Muscle Podcast. My name is Paul Klingen, and I'm your host. We got a Q&A today. If you didn't get a chance to listen to Pam Owens on the last podcast, she talked all things golf, mobility, nutrition, and how it is really important to dial those in for your game. We got the U.S. Open coming up, so anyone that wants to learn a little bit more, uh, if they're going to be golfing a lot in this summer, really good person to listen to. Uh, I personally just finished Loki, so if you are a big Marvel fan, Star Wars fan like me, Disney Plus is a constant uh, in the household. So if you guys enjoy those things, shoot me a message uh, on social media, and I'd love to just chat back and forth with them. But like I said, we got a Q&A today. We'll have a few more Q&As coming up. Uh, I personally am wrapping up a oh, five, six-month cut now, and we're building five months before that. So it's just been a really long process diving into the world of aesthetics and training and hypertrophy. And I'll be sharing a lot of the lessons that I've learned with that, and I'll be really excited to dive into the science, the mindset, uh, the approach, and everything that we did to get me ready. I got a photo shoot on the 21st of June, uh, so I'll be diving into that in one of the next Q&As. But today we got five questions, five different people uh, chiming in with different thoughts, different questions, and I figured I would dive into them on a Q&A today. Uh, and so we'll go right into the first one. Uh, and this guy was from, or this, this question was from a guy named Phil. And he was talking about the balance that you got to find with work, right? And so everyone works, they want to make more money, you want to get promoted, but at what point does that cost you your health? And so he was, we were talking, he was looking at, you know, what the people in the job above him have where he's working to get promoted to. And he's like, man, I don't know if I like that work-life balance. They're always on. They always have to be answering emails, calls at these crazy nights of the day. None of them have their health in check. And that's not to say you can't have really high stress, high taxing jobs and have your health, but there's always going to be something that falls off. And for a lot of people, it is their health. And so I, I shared with him this quote from the Dalai Lama that I really love and it helps kind of put in perspective what we do. So the quote is, when asked what surprised him about humanity the most, the Dalai Lama replied, man, because he sacrifices his health in order to make money, then he sacrifices money to recuperate his health. From there, he goes on to say, and then he is so anxious about the future that he does not enjoy the present, the result being that he does not live in the present or the future. He lives as, he lives as if he is never going to die and then dies having never really lived. And so with that quote, a lot of different powerful things to unpack, but the big one that I shared with him is you sacrifice your health saying, oh, I'll prioritize it you know, down the road, oh, next year, next year, next year, next year. As soon as I get this, then I'll be able to go and prioritize it. And then you get to a point and you're like, wow, like, I got the money, but I am so far behind in the health. And the thing about health is it's working against you as you get older. So that's where I would always encourage people build a really good foundation because there's plenty of time to make money because your mind is what's making your money for a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely your body. But if your body is something that you're requiring to be at optimal levels to make you money, then you also probably should be prioritizing your health. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword there in that health is thing to prioritize the most because when you're... 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, there's plenty of time to be working, but your body is always going to degrade from a certain point. And so the more that you can get that to a higher point, the longer uh, and healthier lifespan that you're going to have. And so that was just a perspective to share when you're, you know, you're fiending for that promotion. And this particular guy worked at Amazon, right? So everyone knows how intense that can be as a job. Is that L6? Is that L7? Is that L8 role worth having your health and in, in other parts of your life too, relationships, your mental well-being, really sacrifice for the extra money. And that's only an answer that you can ask yourself, but I'd also have you consider that it's much harder to recuperate your health than it is to, you know, find a different job or, um, you know, make that delta in, in a side hustle or something. Next question coming from Brian. 
uh, was really how do I find good sources of protein that are both efficient in the terms of getting what I need out of them, but also cost effective. So there's a ton of different collagen uh, thing, uh, collagen peptides and different uh, superfoods and foods getting more and more expensive. The more and more marketing says this thing is a superfood. Uh, and at the end of the day, sometimes you just want, hey, I want a protein shake. That is my whey protein. That makes it just clear cut. This is what I'm putting in my smoothie. I don't need all the extra stuff, right? So you can really quickly get a $60 uh, tub and it only has 15 servings. And so there's two numbers that I use in my, my background. Uh, if you listen to this podcast, I don't know my story. I was in advertising. And so a lot of the different numbers that we use will be cost per click CPC cost per thousand or cost per impression, uh, cost per thousand impression, I think is CPM. So I'm a little out of, out of, out of practice, but I'll constantly use these CPA CPC models when looking at things like protein. So if you're looking at cost per calorie, what you're looking at here is how many calories is going to cost me to get the protein that I want. So one gram of protein is four calories. So that is the most efficient that you can get. What you'll run into is there's a lot of different bars. You'll see a lot in like, uh, uh, RX bars is a great example. It'll say high source of protein. And then you'll look on the back and it's, you know, 10, 12 grams of protein, 240 calories. And kind of the golden rule that I have with myself and that works really well for my clients is 10 calories for every gram of protein. So what that translates to is 20 grams of protein for 200 calories. Anything off of that ratio really just is, and it's not to say that that food's bad. It can, it can serve a purpose in a hike, in, in a workout, in a snack, whatever it is. But if the goal is protein, you want it to be as efficient as possible. So let's say you're having uh, perfect bars. Those are a great example. Those can be 330, 340 calories. They got a ton of fat in them. Uh, fat's not necessarily bad, but that scales the calories up. So now you're getting... 16 grams of protein for 340 calories, you can see how that kind of exceeds the the 10 to 1 that you want to be having. Uh, in terms of best in class, if you were to do that, you're looking at things like tuna. Um, that's going to be anywhere from 6 to 1 or 4 to 1. Uh, obviously, chicken's going to be really good there. Uh, and like a whey protein from on our optimum nutrition is going to be a really good option there because you're getting anywhere from 25 grand, 20 to 25 grams for 120 calories. So something to think from there. And then speaking of those big tubs, I was recently at Costco and they had this big optimum nutrition, whey protein. I want to say it was like 30 bucks, 120 servings. So at that point, there's another number to look at cost per serving. So if you're hitting this 10, 10 grams of, uh, 10 calories to one gram of protein ratio, so 200 to 20, and then you're saying, all right, cool. What's the cheapest I can get that serving? Take this into account. So I talk about, you know, the, the really expensive fancy name brand protein powders. And that's not to say you can't get them. If you really like them, taste is going to play a role. But if you're trying to be as efficient financially as possible and time-wise, $60 for 15 servings is $4 a serving. Verse, we look at that 120 serving, $30 optimum nutrition bag from Costco. That's 25 cents a serving. So these are all things that, you know, I'm at the at the grocery store and my clients will be at the grocery store looking through this lens of like, all right, is this going to be efficient? Is this going to be something that I enjoy eating? And then you blend those two together for the goals that you have. Next question coming in from my man, um, Tom. And this one is also a little bit work related. So around bedtime, the goal is to get to bed, all right, obviously. Uh, but a lot of people not just him, but they'll struggle with thinking about work, right? So checking email. And I'll run into this a lot myself where I'm like, I got to do a podcast. I got to do a blog, content this, client that, you know, where are things at? Uh, that's just kind of the role that entrepreneuring entrepreneurship takes you down. That's the role that, you know, a, a really taxing job can take you down. And one of the things that I found through mindfulness and meditation is Letting your mind wander is a great way for it to go and find anxiety, right? So the ability to focus it on something is going to help you be present in that moment. So a lot of people will turn to TV. A lot of people will turn to phones, uh, social media as ways to escape work. But to a degree, that's just going to cause your mind to constantly be looking for more and more things. As you're scrolling, you're not focusing on anything particularly. When you're watching TV, it's really easy to still zone out. So my advice with this is always to find something that allows you to play or something that allows you to really focus in on something that you love doing. So I'm looking at my Legos right here. When I'm doing and building my 
baby Yoda Lego. I'm focused on that. I'm so focused on it that I don't have time to be anxious about the future or looking back into the past of the day because I'm focused on that present moment. For someone, this could be playing video games and you're just focused and dialed in on what is happening on that screen. You can't think about work. That could be going and playing an intramural sport. That could be pottery. That could be horseback riding. It could be whatever it is that you love doing, but a lot of times the first things to fall when we get really busy, when we get really stressed, one is our health, two is our passions. So going in and diving into a passion, something that you haven't done in a really long time, something that you really love doing, you're going to get wrapped up in that. And one last little metaphor before I go on to the next question, think about an animal that is on the African savanna, so like a gazelle. They have a lot of predators, a lot of things to be anxious about. And what's happening at a neurological level is the brain is constantly scanning or constantly thinking for threats. And while the job or the presentation isn't necessarily a life and death situation, your brain is thinking about that and is anxious and running through a bunch of different scenarios of could this be something that is a stressful situation, right? And stress gets black labeled. All stress is stress to the central nervous system. And so you're constantly having this fight or flight feeling of, oh, do I, need to, do I need to run? Do I need to run? Do I need to go? And when you think of a gazelle on the African plain, those animals are constantly looking out for cheetahs, lions, hyenas, everything. And so when you're worried about work, you're constantly thinking about email, text, project, deadline this, deadline that. What you don't see, and this is usually with the younger animals because they don't realize how in trouble they are, right? They're on the bottom of the food chain. They're playing. And that's not to say that you need to go and roughhouse with your next door neighbor, but the absence of stress is going to happen when you are playing because you are so focused, you're so present, you're having fun. So whatever it is that is play for you, I would recommend go and do that more when you're trying to pull away from work. Really good example is golf. You can definitely intermix golf uh, and work. People call you, got to answer. So I, I didn't think of that one right away, but something that just makes you present, something that makes you focus, something that really activates um, your, your attention is a really good way to get out of uh, always thinking about work and, and not really being present in that present moment. All right, so the next question is coming in from Emma, and this one was around tracking alcohol correctly and also how to fit alcohol into whether it's your calories, your macros, your goals, your day, your week, whatever that is. Um, and so when I'm thinking about tracking for the day or I know that it's going to be an event, uh, there's a few things that I like to do from a language standpoint to make the alcohol piece a lot more empowering. So a lot of people will go, oh, my goal is to not really drink, right? I want to try and not drink a lot. I want to limit my drinking. It's really vague. It's also not really empowering. And anything beyond what you believe is ultimately a really rigid restriction of not drinking at all is going to leave you falling short. If you say, oh, my goal is to really limit my drinking, and then you drink, well, there's a lot of ambiguity in there. So the language I really like to use is my goal is to have three drinks. Because what that does is one, you are planning on doing it. So there's no feeling bad because you intentionally said, I'm planning on doing this as part of my plan. My goal is to go and have three drinks at this company party, be really present, ask a lot of questions, have a lot of fun. So the thing that you can do with that too is because now you know what your intention is, you can back out of that for the day. So if you have 2,400 calories to work with, you know that you're planning on having three glasses of wine, great. Now you know what you have to play with with the other 1,800. So I really like that language rather than saying, oh, I'm going to try not to. Try not to, right? Yoda says do or do not. There is no try. And if you fail, you're going to feel really bad about it. So intentionally go and do it. Set it as a goal. Your goal is to drink three drinks. And then you have something to work towards. And when you hit those three drinks, you're like, sick. This is what I planned all along. In regards to tracking, this one gets a little bit tougher, right? Because if you go out and you're not getting things by the can and you can't scan it or you have no idea how uh, healthy or heavy these wine pours are, you really don't know. I pulled a few numbers just to give you some context uh, as to what alcoholic drinks would be. But if we're looking at an IPA, so an Elysian space that's really popular in the Seattle area, 12 ounces, going to be 247, we'll call that 250 calories. 
Coors Light is going to be 102, so we call that 100 calories. Then we look at a Pinot Noir, so a red wine, there's going to be around 120 calories for 5 ounces. Rosé, 85 calories for 5 ounces. Then from a mixed drinks, hard alcohol standpoint, rum and Coke, 185 calories for an 8-ounce drink. Casamigos, shot of tequila, 64 uh, calories for 1 ounce. So what I also did there was give you a high end and a low end. Uh, you could also throw Trulies or um, you know all the seltzers that people love in there. Those are going to be 100 calories. They're starting to get lower. It's like this race to the bottom. Who can make the lowest calorie alcoholic drink? Uh, and then eventually you get to a point where you're like, just have a LaCroix and you get everything that you need because there's not a lot of alcohol in it anyway. You're just drinking a drink. Um, but what I did is give you a high point and a low point. So now if you're doing, oh, I'll trade this for that, you can go out and have 10 Coors Lights or you can have four IPAs. Any golfers out there, right, you're on the course, four IPAs is going to knock you out. That's 1,000 calories. You can have nine Coors Lights. You're probably still going to be able to hit the golf ball, and that's actually less calorically. So a lot of my clients will be like, oh, man, what should I do? Like, I'm golfing. What should I, what should I do this weekend? I'll be like, hey, I want you to have five Coors Lights. Because if I know that they are going to have three IPAs, five course lights is a better trade-off calorically, right? 500 versus 750, you go and play, you know, 50 rounds, let's just say, like that right there is your 10 pounds that you've been trying to lose simply by trading out course lights for IPAs. And you can apply this to Mariners game or whatever, sports games, wherever you're at, um, just in Seattle. So I always think Mariners, you can apply this to sports games. You can apply this to events, concerts. You can apply this to golf. You can apply this to weddings, like whatever it is you want to do. Coors Light instead of a Space Dust or an IPA. Then from a wine standpoint, you have red wine at 120 or you have rosé at 85. I love me a good rosé. It's light. It feels like summer. And if I'm just drinking wine to drink wine... It's going to be, it's, obviously, if you're going to have red wine, you want to have it with like a nice meal. If you're going to have white wine, you want to pair it with like fish or whatever you're trying to pair with. I'm by no means a sommelier, so don't listen to me. But that's another opportunity to trade this for that. Then when you're looking at hard alcohol, maybe you're out, right? You're out at the club. You're out partying. Um, and you got a bunch of mixed drink options. A Casamigo and a Topo Chico mixed drink, 64 calories. And then you're sipping on a little bit of... Obviously, the, the water, the shot, 64 calories, you can make that last pretty long. Versus a rum and coke, right? All of a sudden, that's three times more calorically dense, and you got the same, same effect. You're getting a shot with some coke in it. So just pull out the coke, take the shot, or make the shot last because it's on ice, and then you're going to be much better off there. Um, so a bunch of different tips there in tracking alcohol, planning for alcohol to make it not hit as hard. Um, that said, it's not necessarily the alcohol at the time that's going to trip you up. It's the hangover and the alcohol um, munchies that you get at 2 a.m. And then the craving for any sort of energy because you slept like trash. That's a podcast for another time. But anytime you drink, I'd say over two drinks, uh, kind of depends on the person, but anything over two or three drinks is going to disrupt your circadian rhythm. Uh, it's going to keep you out of REM sleep. And that is why you are so tired the next day. As I get older, I notice just how tired I am. I don't really get hang I don't really get like hangover headaches, but I am so tired the next day. And it's because I don't get to my REM sleep. I don't get to stage three. I don't get to stage four. And so then the next day I'm really tired. When the body's really tired, it's smart. It knows what foods are going to give it energy really quick. And that's generally going to be something high in sugar, high in carbohydrates. Not necessarily that carbohydrates are bad, but carbohydrates are going to get a bump in blood sugar right away and your body knows that your brain is smarter than you are it's running algorithms at all times uh, and that algorithm that it's running at 2 p.m on a hangover day is asking for some thai food or some taco bell cool so last question this one is from emma and this one is something i'm going to be diving into a lot more uh, with blogs with content i'll do podcasts specifically on reverse dieting uh, it's a process that i've been taking a lot of people through because it's a problem that a lot of people deal with. Too many people under eat. Uh, too many people think that they need to have 1,200 calories to lose weight. Too many people think that they need to do 12 workouts and starve themselves in order to find that calorie deficit. Calories in, calories out is going to dictate weight loss. No questions about it. What people don't realize is that there is going to be metabolic adaptation when you train your body to live off a certain calorie threshold. 
So if you go into a diet, 2,000 calories is maintenance, then you start having 1,500 calories, eventually the body's going to be like, all right, mother... Oh, so are. All right, brother. We are going to adapt to that 1,500. And it may not bring it all the way down to 1,500, but the body saying, you're, you're saying the body, hey, I need you to learn to survive and find homeostasis on a lower calorie threshold. Because every time you cut calories, that's like cutting your sales team and saying, hey, I need you guys to get the same sales numbers, but we just fired 40% of the, the squad. So you guys are good with that, right? Right? Eventually stuff's going to dip. You're going to adapt and it's usually going to always adapt down from a sales team, sales standpoint. Maybe maybe you guys fire the right people. Uh, but in this example, your body's going to adapt to that lower calorie threshold. Your basal metabolic rate, your metabolism is going to downregulate so it can find that homeostasis. When that happens, the body is not functioning. The cells at a cellular level, that's what the metabolism is. It's every single cell in the body. It's your livers, it's your skin, it's your brain, it's your heart, all doing their job. There's gonna, they're going to downregulate. Um, and so a reverse diet is the process of saying, hey, you cannot lose weight sustainably at 800 calories, which is what we would need to diet down to from a deficit standpoint in order to lose weight. So we need to reverse you up. We need to, in a really strategic way, get your calories from maintenance and then add 50 to 100 calories. And I'm going to give you guys ranges shortly, but we need to get the body not basically to adapt up so that we can get maintenance that was 1500 to 1600 to 1700 to 1800 to 1900 and raise that limbo bar so that you have a limbo bar that you can then go under and diet on. Anyone listening that is super frustrated that they haven't been able to lose weight despite trying for years and years and years, nine times out of 10, this is what has happened. You've down-regulated your metabolism, and it's adapted to a really low calorie threshold, and it's really hard to get under that number. And you might go six days at 1,200 calories, but then you have that wedding, you have that event, you have that night that you go out, 3,000 calories, boom, you blew past your weekly energy balance average, and that's that's adding weight on, right? It's super frustrating, I totally understand it. You, you, you'd think that winning six days and losing one would put you in the winning category, but the body's like this bank statement. It's just like, hey, I don't care how good you were Monday through Friday, and even Saturday, you spent ten grand at the tables or wherever you're at uh, to to spend that money, and so it's gonna give you the net balance. Um, so in this reverse diet, there's three different buckets that I'll have people go through: uh, conservative, moderate, and aggressive. Conservative is saying, hey, I want to be really careful about adding on extra fat. So a good example of this is you know, I'll, I'll use myself. Two weeks from now, I'll do a photo shoot. I'm going to reverse diet to get my calories back up to maintenance so that I can go and live and have an awesome summer and not be stuck at this 2,000 calorie level. It's a really low level for me. So what I'm going to try and do, I've got to a leanness that is probably not sustainable, pretty close, but maybe not long-term always sustainable, but I don't want to just put a bunch of fat back on. So I'm going to be aiming for 0.2% of body weight gain per week and really try and minimize fat gain. The other version of this is your reverse dieting to upregulate your metabolism so that you can go into a weight loss phase successfully. And the big thing with that uh, for fellas, you can kind of think of this as like a lean gain approach. Whatever you put on, you got to take off. So when you go really conservative with it, it's going to make it easier in that weight loss phase. Now that said, on the other end of the spectrum, is the really aggressive 0.8% of your body weight a week. This is going to be for someone who isn't as worried about putting on a little bit of extra fat and they actually want to get up to maintenance and they want to get back to feeling really good as soon as possible, right? Because when you're in that deficit, you're losing weight, you are pulling that body out of homeostasis, you are stressing out your metabolism, you want to get all of your energy, your sleep, your hormones, all the biofeedback, uh, could be your menstrual cycle, could be your libido, could be just having a, a, a good day and a good mood, adding calories right away is going to help you get there if you're really aggressive with that. So that's 0.8% of your body weight a week. In the middle of that's 0.5%. And so you're like, well, Paul, how am I supposed to know what that looks like? I got a nice easy number for you. Uh, and this will be the last thing we go over. So if you got a pen and paper, take it out. Uh, and obviously if you're driving, don't take out a pen and paper, focus on the road. So let's say someone's 1500 calories. We take the conservative approach 
that's going to be a 10% calorie bump. 10% of 1,500 is 150. That is bringing your calories up to 1,650, right? We add 150 to six, fifty. We add 150 to 1,500. That is going to be your target calories, and then you work up from there. Keeping in mind, looking at measurements, looking at the scale, looking at energy, training performance, and everything else in there. Then you have 0.5%. This is the moderate. 20% bump, 1,500 calories means you add 300. That's 1,800 calories, right? Then you have 0.8%, 30%. So that is 450 calories added. That is going to turn your 1,500 into 1,950, right? So a pretty big spectrum. That's a 300 calorie difference between conservative and aggressive. But you want to find whatever it is that works best for you and knowing if you want to maintain the leanness as much as possible, you want to be conservative. If you want to get the heck out of that diet because that was terrible and trash, um, maybe you're a little bit more aggressive. Maybe you're somewhere in between. But that's what you're looking at with a reverse diet in terms of setting a prescription. Uh, and obviously, this is what I do. This is what the team uh, Logan does as well with Elemental Coaching Project. So everything that I talk about are questions that have come in uh, from clients and I wanted to touch on these on a podcast, dive into them a little bit more so that you guys can learn about them. But if you've been following along, we made the shift from Down Dog Athletics to Elemental Coaching Project. There's four elements uh, to improve your health and fitness so that it is an asset, not a liability, and so that it improves every element of your life, right? So you got training, nutrition, recovery, and mental performance. They all matter. They all matter equally. If you ignore one completely, things are going to fall out of balance, and eventually you're not going to be able to maintain and sustain it. And this is a comprehensive approach. It is definitely a, uh, people will say holistic. I try and avoid that because it just sounds like essential oils, but you can 100% call it holistic. Um, all of it matters and all of it plays a role in health. And the people that we work with, we look at as many things as possible, get as much data as possible between uh, the, the training app that I have uh, that clients work out in. You got Whoop, you got your iWatch, your, or not Apple, you got your Apple Watch, you got your Garmin. There's so much tech, there's so much data to be aware of these things. And so what we do is we pull it all in, look at it, look at your goal, align them all so that it's something that you can do. And then we say, all right, based on the season that you're in, it, like summer's coming up, right? It's going to be a much harder time to diet. So let's make this a season of maintenance from a nutritional standpoint. We'll train hard. We'll make sure that it aligns with the lifestyle stressors that you have. And then maybe there's a better time to find a diet phase. All stuff that we take into account. So if you want help on any of this, these are all things that we cover uh, with Elemental Coaching Project. Would love to chat, fill out an application uh, on elementalcoachingproject.com. We've got the link in the show notes. You can always shoot me a message on social media, Paul underscore Klingon, or shoot Logan a message if you know Logan and he brought you to this podcast as well. But uh, other than that, I'll catch you guys next time on the Mindful Muscle Podcast. Uh, if you enjoy the podcast, leave a rating and review five stars. Help us grow the podcast. Uh, we'll see you guys next time. Uh, peace out. <music>